often told, God loves you. But what does that really mean? That some impersonal force, galaxies away, may consider you from time to time? Or that you are a single drop in a vast ocean of humanity and God cares for all of it? There are billions of lives, billions of stories. Can we really believe he has great destinies planned for all of them? Surely the ruler of the universe has more important affairs than to notice the needs of one singular individual. But hear this, nothing could be further from the truth. When God says, I love you, it means that he crafted every detail of your being. Your every feature is his perfect design. His mind perceives your worries and your thoughts. His heart is broken by your pain. You are his child, created in his image. Your value exceeds all the riches of earth. Your worth extends beyond the stars. And though you may be unaware, he's carefully constructing the events of your life to build his kingdom. If you are willing, he can and will achieve wonders through your hands. It is the deepest passion, the most meaningful promise. It is your security, your hope, and your future. It is the truth beyond doubt. God loves you. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. And I believe the Holy Spirit healed some people today. Amen. I believe it. I don't need to see or feel any kind of... I just... That's what faith is. The substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. So I trust that God did what we asked Him to do. Am I making a weird noise? No. Okay, good. I'm just hearing things in my head. That's even worse, isn't it? Worse than making a strange noise is the fact that you feel like you hear it and it's not really happening. Hallelujah. I've titled this today, I Must Have the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you something. If there's ever been a statement that is true, I must have the Holy Spirit in my life. Look at your neighbor today and just say, you got to have him. you got to have him. you got to have him. You know, every difficult passage in the Word, if you ever read the Word, it's like, God, what you're asking me to do is extremely challenging. <laughs> Lord, do you know the people I work with? <laughs> Nobody's ever said that. God, have you met my neighbor? Have you ever said that? <laughs> but I'm always brought to this conclusion. I must have the Holy Spirit. I must have Him. All right, let's go to the book of Micah. The book of Micah, chapter 6. Amen. For those of you that are younger, you never had the problem of trying to find Micah in the Bible. You just go to your phone and there it is, or your iPad, or you look up on the screen up here. But Micah is one of the minor prophets. And I want to read chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And we're going to talk about it. Hear now what the Lord says. I think we, that, that is, we need to have that thought every time the word, of, the word of God is brought forth. Whether it's me or Brother David or anyone you're listening to on the radio or TV or YouTube or whatever. If the word of God is brought forth, I think our frame of mind, our thought, our heart should be saying, all right, listen to what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. 
Hear, O you mountains, the Lord's complaint, and you strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a complaint against his people, and he will contend with Israel. Let me stop right there just for a moment. Micah, Micah didn't water it down. Micah brought it to you blunt, just like it is, not with sugar on top or anything else like that. He just brought it. And so he's bringing it. He's not putting He's just bringing it. And he will contend with Israel. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? Testify against me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Acacia Grove to Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you. But to do justly, to love mercy, And to walk humbly with your God. Lord, we we come before you this morning and thank you for that gentle presence of your Holy Spirit that's here today. You are surely doing a work in this place today. And we welcome you and ask you to do more. Work in us, God. As the word is being declared. Work in us Lord. We open up our ears and our hearts to hear. What it is you want to speak into our lives today. Because you knew this day before we ever got here. You've prepared it for us. We receive this in your mighty name. Amen. God gave Micah a message for his generation. He wrote that message down so that people would not forget about it. Micah lived about 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. He was a country boy from the little town of Morasheth, a few miles outside of Jerusalem. Scholars tell us that he lived about the same time as his fellow prophets Isaiah and Hosea. In fact, many think that he and Isaiah were good friends. Because parts of the book that he wrote sounds very familiar to Isaiah. If you were to look at Micah and try to sum him up, you would say he was blunt, he was direct, he was plain spoken, no nonsense, sort of a straight arrow kind of guy. And here's what describes the situation of Israel during the time that he was speaking to them. There was international tension Israel was caught between three nations who were at war, Assyria, Egypt, and the Philistines. The greater threat came from the Assyrians who had exacted tribute from Israel in exchange for peace. In other words, they were sort of in slavery to Assyria and they were paying tribute to them so that Assyria wouldn't wipe them out. So there was international tension. There was also religious corruption. Micah rallied against the, railed, not rallied, but railed against the priests of God who were taking bribes from people and giving them whatever they wanted to hear in exchange for bribes. It's almost like all the leaders of the day were just not true leaders. And so there was international tension and religious corruption. There was also moral Chaos. 
This follows the first two. It was every man for himself. The rich people were ripping off the poor people. The leaders were taking bribes. And everyone else was cheating everybody else. You couldn't trust the merchants. You couldn't trust the leaders. You couldn't be sure about the members of your own family. So as we read that, it's clear that Micah lived in a day very similar to our day, didn't he? This book could have been written in 2022. In some ways, it sounds like Micah has been watching the news. <laughs> so Micah wrote to a world facing huge problems. And he wrote condemning the sin and the hypocrisy that was rampant among God's people. He didn't pull any punches. He didn't take no prisoners. He dropped into this severe message a delightful passage of Scripture. Even though it's just a few verses long that tells us exactly what God wants from us. So that's very important. You ever pray to prayer, God, what do you want from me? He tells us this. And first he says this. God isn't looking for a better sacrifice. In verse 6, he says, what can I bring to the Lord? Should we bring him burnt offerings? Should we bow before God most high with offerings of yearling calves? A yearling calf was a calf that was one year old. It was considered the prime age for sacrifice. And so perhaps God would be pleased if we give him the very best that we have to give. But the answer is no. And I know you probably won't hear this from many preachers, but God doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your money. Giving doesn't bless God. Giving blesses you. Jesus himself said it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. So it blesses God more to give to you than it does for him to receive from you. And it blesses you more to give than it blesses God to receive it. So to come and give, if I could give a million dollars... How would that impress God who owns it all? Giving is for you. It's about your heart. And we act like, and, and I, I've been guilty of this in the past, of acting like if we don't give, God won't be able to pay the bills. But I'm going to tell you something. God's going to pay his bills. God's going to take care of his bills. And giving is about the heart of the person. It's between you and God. It shouldn't be something used to condemn. It shouldn't be used as something to scare. Giving is a blessing that God has given you the opportunity to partake in. And when God says, this is what I want from you, He's not saying, I want a better sacrifice from you. He also says this, I'm not looking for more sacrifices. In verse 7, he says, Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? In other words, it went from, maybe instead of giving my best, maybe if we can give him some extravagant, we can impress God with just some extravagant sacrifices. We could offer so many rams and so much oil that it, the, there would be rivers of sacrifices. Surely that would make God happy. Doing more always sounds like the right answer. But this is not on the top of the list for God. It's not that you give a better sacrifice or that you give more sacrifices. He also says God isn't looking for the supreme sacrifice. In verse 7, he says, Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? Now, obviously, he's speaking that in a sarcastic tone. God has never 
condoned that. It's an immoral suggestion. But the people are suggesting, suggesting if we give our firstborn, then perhaps then God would be pleased with us and forgive our sins. But the answer is no. God is saying, this is not, let's make a deal. Whatever you want, Lord, we'll do it. You name the price, we'll meet it. They thought that they could trade sacrifice and receive forgiveness. In essence, they thought that, they, that God could be bought the same way their leaders could be bought. We do the same thing. We say, Lord, I'll, I'll change. I'll do anything you want. You name your price. You want a missionary? I'll go. You want me to, be, me to be married? I'll go. You want me to be single? I'll stay single. I'm your man. Lord, I'll be a preacher. I'll be a pastor. I'll be a deacon. I'll pray every day. I'll read my Bible. Whatever you want from me, that's what I'll do. I really mean it, Lord. There's nothing wrong with those sentiments. They sound noble. They sound proper. And God is pleased when we offer ourselves to Him. But what's wrong is these things only deal with the outside. Because God ultimately wants your heart. I know that's cliche. So can, can you forget that that's cliche just for a few minutes and hear God? If you've been in church any time, for any amount of time when somebody says God wants your heart, it's one of those things we just put it in the file because we've heard it a million times. But can I say to you just because it's been said a million times, does it mean it's not just as true now as it was back then, the first time you ever heard it? God wants your heart. He wants your heart. You can be a missionary and have a hard heart. You can be married and have a hard heart. Single, have a hard heart. You can be a preacher and have a hard heart. God rejected every offer made by them because they had completely missed the point. They wanted to make a deal with God. And God simply wanted them. He wanted their hearts. If I may talk to the room today for just a moment. In this room right now, there's a significant number of people here that struggle with different things. We have people here today that struggle with addiction to chemical substances. Is that okay? Is this true? Is this true? According to the world, your chances of becoming sober and staying sober are not good. According to the world. You listening? Sounds like you're listening because it's very quiet. And we have a ministry here that increases those chances. And there are steps that illuminate the path that lead you to a place of freedom. That okay. And it's called Celebrate Recovery. And it takes the Word and it illuminates the path that leads to freedom. But if I can just for a moment speak to you. Let me speak to you those who are specifically living in a rehab right now. And I want you to listen. This is blunt. Can I be Micah just for a minute? This is blunt. I'm going to cut any corners, but this is God's truth and I need you to listen. Unless God gets your heart, you will not be free. Unless you give Him your heart, you can't become free. You can't. You can blame it on the rehab. You can blame it on the leaders. You can blame it on your family. You can blame it on your friends. You can blame it on your circumstances. You can blame it on every kind of condition there is. But unless God has your heart, 
And I feel led to say this. I'm going to say it. Micah's rising up in me. There's some of you, there's some of you, and it, it, it doesn't matter who else knows you know, but there's some of you that are playing the game, and God knows you're playing the game. Outside of the rehab, there's some of you in the church that you're playing the game. God knows you're playing the game. You no more intend for God to have your heart. You no more intend for God to change anything about you. You come to church on Sunday to make your conscience feel better, but you have no intentions of surrendering your heart to Him. You're never going to see freedom in your life. You're never going to be overwhelmed by God's grace until you become ready to surrender your heart to Him. You've got to give Him your heart. You've got to give Him your heart. You've got to do that. But some of you here, you desperately want freedom. You're not those that are like just playing the game. There's some here that you desperately want freedom, but you're trying to get it without God. You're trying to get it some other way. You're trying to get there through some other means. And you will be no better off than those who are just playing the game. Because God is your only hope. But before you feel down about that, just because God is your only hope, that's not bad news. God is the only hope, but what a hope He is. <laughs> and what a change He can bring. And although the world says that 3% can come out of addiction and stay in freedom. God says 100% who gives them their heart, He will walk with them through this life and you will have freedom and grace that is more than sufficient. This world is battling odds of 3%, but God's at 100 the last time I checked. And this is why you must have the Holy Spirit. He's not asking for a better sacrifice or more sacrifice or the supreme sacrifice. I've seen so many people come through church. The last 22 years, I've seen them do some of the craziest stuff. Had one guy come and he said, God told him to wear two different color shoes. Had people come through and say, God said, told me not to shave my face. Some of us look better with some hair on our face, right? But I've heard some of the craziest things. God's not, God's not trying to confuse you. He's just saying, give me your heart. Give me your heart. Give me your heart. What God wants, and here's what we need to get. What God wants isn't possible without God. It, hopefully that didn't confuse us. What God wants from us is not possible without God. That, that used to get me down until I actually got what God was trying to say what God was trying to say is what I want from you is only possible when you allow me to have control of you and give me your heart and then I can do through you what you can't do outside of me and so your struggle becomes surrender which becomes a life of grace and faith and so Micah tells the people, he says, The Lord has told you what is good, and this is what He requires of you. To do what is right. This is verse 8. To do what is right. To love mercy. And to walk humbly with your God. Now, we can't look at the Old Testament without looking at it through the lens of the New Testament. It's so very important. 
We do not live under the old covenant. We live under the new covenant. And so when we look at the old covenant, we need to look at it through the lens of that which is new. In other words, the gospel, Jesus Christ. And so this verse is not a way to make God happy. It is not the way to find salvation. It is not the way to earn God's favor. We need to see this first for what it is. God was asking them to do what is right, to love mercy, and to humbly walk with God. The gospel tells us that Jesus is all these things. That Jesus has fully fulfilled all these things. He did what was right. He loved mercy and he walked humbly before God. And so because of that, when we believe in Christ, we step into that place of righteousness because we are with him who does what is right, who loves mercy, and who walks humbly with God. And now that we have his Holy Spirit, we can pursue these things that God wants from the place of sons and daughters. In the past, before we knew God, we may pursue these things, but not from the perspective of a son or a daughter. But now we've been placed in this family, a family that is known, a family that has a heritage of doing what is right. Loving mercy and walking humbly. And so as sons and daughters of God, we pursue that. And we cannot pursue it or even come close to attaining it without the Holy Spirit. We must have the Holy Spirit. To do what is right is not possible Without the Holy Spirit. This is talking about the character of God. And the Bible's full of examples of doing what is right. And doing what is right seems contrary to my flesh sometimes. My flesh doesn't want to bless people who curse me. Does yours? Come on. Does yours? I know it doesn't. You stop talking to them. You might even quit church over it. You'll cut ties completely if someone goes wrong. If someone goes against you. If someone does something wrong. It is not a natural thing to do to bless someone who is out for us. To pray for our enemies. Yeah, we're praying for them. We're praying hellfire. We're praying something happens to them. Hopefully not. But that's what the flesh desires. So what I want you to see is to do what is right is something only the Holy Spirit can do within us. The Holy Spirit within us, even though they've cursed us, even though they've persecuted us, even though they, are, they have established themselves firmly and strongly that they are our enemies, the Holy Spirit within us, the same Spirit that was in Christ, we pray for them. We do what is right. Doing what is right is making peace, not choosing a side. Although your flesh wants to pick the best side. We got to make sure our side has more numbers. <laughs> but doing what is right is making peace in the church. Doing what is right is not sowing discord. It's sowing peace. Are you with me? Doing what is right requires the Holy Spirit in our life. To love mercy is impossible without the Holy Spirit. The longer I've lived, I've come to find out that I love mercy for me, not as much for others. 
right? But the Holy Spirit in me loves mercy for others every bit as it loves it for me. It is a Holy Spirit trait. It is a Holy Spirit characteristic. Mercy is a loyal love. It is a patient love. His mercy endures forever is the way the Bible describes it. Many of the Psalms say it over and over and over again. It is forever, it is a patient kind of merciful love that we're so thankful that God has for us. But the Holy Spirit in us is so thankful that God has it for our enemies, our friends, our family. It means loving the unlovely even when they don't love you back. It speaks to our obligation to care for people who don't care for us. Doing unto others as God has done unto you. I don't know about y'all, but God has treated me way better than I deserve. God has ble Has God blessed you? God has blessed me. Then bless others. Has God forgiven you? Then forgive others. But pastor, that's hard. Not to Holy Spirit. Not to Holy Spirit. It's who He is. Has God lifted you up when you were down? Lift somebody up when they're down. Has God overlooked your faults? God's overlooking your faults right now. Has God overlooked your faults? Come on, y'all. What's up with y'all today? It's translated as lovely or beautiful. It is a quality that will make you beautiful to others. To show mercy it makes you beautiful. And it's a Holy Spirit trait. And we've got to be in tune to the Holy Spirit for this to operate in our lives. Anybody ever seen a sign like this? Does anybody stop every single time? Would everybody agree with me that sometimes it's a difficult decision? Is that okay? Come on, y'all know me. We're not just going to pretend like we're somebody we're not. Sometimes it's anybody ever sort of look, them, look at them from a distance to try to figure out, is this somebody just trying to take me? Is this just somebody that they could go get a job and they don't want to work? You believe that some of them are that? Yep, yep. So what do you do? What I do, I just ask the Holy Spirit. Just ask the Holy Spirit. I passed a guy the other night, Walmart and Linlock. I was there late, like 11 o'clock, just some special circumstances, trying to find something I couldn't find for the church. And I was pulled out, was headed north, and I noticed there's a guy that was digging in the little box they put clothes and stuff in. And he had his head down there. His feet was almost sticking out of it. He was so far down in there. And the Lord just pricked my heart and said, I want you to go and give him some money. So I pulled up beside him, and I said, what you need? He was very embarrassed, right? I said, I'm not here to embarrass you or anything like that. I said, I just felt the Lord told me to turn around. I said, I, didn't, I, I drove for like eight minutes before I finally listened to God. God's like, are you really going to go to bed tonight knowing you're supposed to do this? I was like, oh, I'm slim, I'm tired. So I gave him some money. I asked him what else he needed, and I said a prayer with him. He asked me to take him up the road to see his girlfriend that worked at the bar. This was before I prayed with him. 
And uh, I told him I was a pastor, and he turned blood red, right? Because I just asked the pastor to take me to the bar. <laughs> I asked him if I could help him with, you know, what was he dealing with. He wasn't ready to talk about what he was dealing with or why he was in the place he was in. You know what? That's between him and God. I did what I did. Didn't do it to be seen. The only reason I'm sharing it with you today is to try to make an example. Because I've driven by people with these signs and not giving them anything. Trying to be listening for the Holy Spirit. Sure, I'm not 100%. I'm sure I miss it sometimes. I've had people that look like they desperately need help and felt the Holy Spirit check me and say, I don't want you to give them anything right now. That's between them and God. Maybe they're close to a bottom, and only God knows that. And they don't need any assistance that God's going to take care of it. I had a guy pull up to the church one day in a brand new Mustang convertible. He had messaged me on Facebook, said he needed, he just got a new job and he needed shoes. And the Lord, I felt like the Lord spoke into my heart and said, I want you to help him. And so I'm going to help him with it. He pulled up in the Mustang. New convertible. Before I, I saw him pull up, before I walked out, I said, okay, God. He said, help him. That's between him and God. That's between him and God. I don't know how God... How, you're like, well, how's God going? I don't know how God's going to use that. It's not my problem. All I know is God knows the details that we do not know. And when you see this sign, don't draw conclusions. Ask Holy Spirit. Is that okay? There's other signs that people don't hold up, though. This one's obvious. Here's one. People don't hold this one up. Some people do not even have the concept of what having God in their life would do for them. They wouldn't walk into a church for anything. <laughs> they don't even understand. They think that they think all you guys are just goofy and baloney and fake. Wasting your time. They might be in the political party that you don't stand for. They might be on the other side of the aisle of a, of a topic that you are completely against. They are without God. Do you know what? They're in the Bible in John 3.16. God said He loved the whole world. He sent His Son. So are we willing to have Holy Spirit let us know when somebody's holding a sign that needs help and we can't get past what they stand for or represent or what religion they're believing in or what God they're believing in or what they think about our stance. So they need God. They need somebody to love them. Amen. And there's this sign. I think this sign's in the church a lot. We need the Holy Spirit to help us. Because when we're broken, we're trying to find what's wrong. We're trying to find recovery and help look think about yourself you don't hold a sign up if you're like me you hide and you isolate and not in a million years would you ever let anybody know that you're broken so you see that these things are not possible without God we must have Holy Spirit we must have him to help us see. When somebody acts out, 
or somebody does something that's just off the chain, or someone's just so, they're, hard, they're angry and they're bitter and they're hard to deal with and you don't understand them, Holy Spirit can help you see that they got a sign and they're asking for help. But all other people can see is the exterior and all they can hear is their words. The Holy Spirit can go deeper. What does God want? God wants us to do right. And God wants us to love mercy. I like how he says love mercy and not just show mercy. It really makes it deeper, doesn't it? Because it's one thing for me to half-heartedly show mercy. But it's another thing for me to love mercy. To love being merciful. You're like, I can't do that. <laughs> no, I can't either. The Holy Spirit can. Finally, he says, walk humbly with God. This isn't possible without the Holy Spirit. What is humility? Humility is having a right view of yourself because you have a right view of God. Humility doesn't mean I'm saying I'm nothing, I'm a worm, I, I'm useless. That's self-pity. Humility is saying God is big. God is great. I am small. God is everything. I have a right view of myself because I have a right view of God. God made me and I belong to Him. Every good thing I have is because of God Almighty. Some have more. Some have less. It doesn't matter to me. I thank God for what I have. I'm going to do the best that I have with what He's given me. And I'm going to leave the outcome to Him because God is greater than me. And He knows more than me. And if we we'll live this way, it'll save us so much trouble. We won't get angry at the silly comments people make. It enables us to be who we are in Christ. And we don't have to worry about what other people think. What does God want? Can you come to the music, please, someone? Thank you. I guess that'd be Haley, seeing that's the only other musician here today. <laughs> I should have just said, Haley, come to the music. Do what's right. Love mercy. Walk in humility. Is it hard? Yes. Difficult? Yes. Is it possible just in you? No. But it is who Holy Spirit is. And this is our Christian duty. To give God our heart and allow Him to live through us to do what is right and to love mercy and to walk with humility. So it brings us back to Micah. If you would just stand with us, please. Why didn't God accept their sacrifices? Why did He turn them down? Because they offered Him everything except the one thing that He really wanted. Their heart. The promise of the Holy Spirit is found in Ezekiel, it's found in Jeremiah, it's found in Isaiah, it's found in Joel. But God specifically says that if you'll give me your heart, He says this, He says, I'll take that stony heart of yours. The one that won't bless those that persecute you, the one that won't pray for your enemies, the one that won't ask about the sign, what God would have you do. I'll take that stony heart and I'll put within you a heart of flesh. I'll put within your heart a desire to do what is right. I'll put within your heart a desire to love and show mercy. I'll put within your heart a heart 
of humility because you'll live out your life knowing that without God you'd be who you always was but with God all things are made new so what I want to ask today is who in here have you never given God your heart I didn't say have you tried to work a program or have you tried to be religious have you tried to give I'm asking you have you have you given him your heart if you're ready to give God your heart to take just a few moments right here, right now to ask you to come take some boldness and some courage, I know but if the Lord is drawing you the Father is drawing you through His Holy Spirit would you give Him your heart come on, and there's nothing you not holding anything back like what's it going to look like when I give God my heart, I don't know I don't know what it looks like I know what it looks like for me, but I don't know what it's going to look like not going to give you all those details he's just saying are you willing to are you willing to sign the contract are you willing to give me your part that's you today going to wait just a few moments who else wants to join this young man at the altar to give the Lord your part